good uh, morning, good afternoon and good evening. I think that covers um, all the, uh, the goods uh, for the webinar today. Welcome to our fifth international webinar. I'm Keith Newton, the International Secretary General of CILT, um, and I'm the host today. Um, we're continuing our series of international uh, research items that we, we have been covering to equip our members all over the world in best practices, best practice responses to the COVID crisis. And our theme today is business continuity and risk. I'm very pleased to welcome two expert speakers today who will cover quite different areas of the subject and I'll introduce them in a minute. Uh, today we've planned for a more extensive discussion and a question and answer session to follow the presentations. Let me though introduce our two speakers and their areas of expertise. Our first speaker today is Vicky Koo. Uh, Vicky is the director of Visilog at Asia Limited and is well known for her strategic supply chain management and brings together operation technology and information technology um, in her consultancy services. With over 30 years of supply chain and logistics management experience, Vicky has re-engineered processes for multinational companies, including Levi's, Columbia, Occidental Chemical, Avery Dennison, and other enterprises globally. Uh, Vicky is well known to me as a fellow of CLT in Hong Kong, and to many of you, I'm sure, and is our Deputy Global Chairperson of Women in Logistics and Transport. That's Willat within CILT. She's been very active um, in Willat and for CLT around the world, helping establish CRT Macau, the CRT China Conference, and the CARF Mentoring Program. So welcome, Vicky. Our second speaker is Oliver Koffler. Uh, Oliver is the director of, uh, is a director at Scala Consulting. Oliver has held a number of leadership roles in supply chain, including operations director for Alliance Healthcare, responsible for all aspects of operations across the UK and was supply chain director for the UK, Ireland and Nordics at Mondelez International. He also includes a spell as sales director for Kraft Foods in Poland, uh, which is another um, aspect of his CV. He has significant operation and leadership experience across all aspects of the supply chain. Oliver is also a fellow of CRT in the UK and has recently been instrumental in working in Kazakhstan and Central Asia with our CIL, CILT and USA funded program there. So welcome to, to Oliver. But that's enough of me. Um, I'd like to um, turn to our subject and to our first speaker. So Vicky, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Keith, for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. I'm very pleased to uh, be able to share over the CILT platform with you about um, business continuity and also the risk mitigations. Um, in my part of the sharing, I will be more focused on how digitalization will help you to mitigate risk. And uh, when Oliver uh, take the second part of the sharing, he will talk about um, the other part of the topic as well. The PowerPoint that we have prepared is a very brief uh, few slides, but I think um, talking over it would be um, more meaningful in this uh, type of webinar. So um, I guess uh, with uh, uh, COVID-19 happening around the world, a lot of um, discussions and frustrations will be over uh, the supply situation in China. And uh, if you may allow, I have take reference from a recent survey brought by the Institute of Supply Management that they have um, uh, surveyed about 600 uh, with uh, response in, in the March survey and they have found out that 44% of the respondents does not have a plan to address the supply disruption from China. 
and that is a serious problem, 44% of it. And among that, 23% uh, of the respondents are reporting current disruptions. And as time goes by, uh, in April and May, uh, we uh, actually, the Institute has um, recorded a higher percentage in the second follow-up survey. And uh, another uh, interesting point to note is once there is a disruption in, in supply, more than half of the respondents has reported difficulty in getting supply chain information from China. And the purpose of sharing this field data with you is trying to highlight um, we have to build up the visibility of information with our suppliers and um, preferably with, on our demand side as well. But in the time of COVID, we see a very big swing of uh, supplies from uh, not getting any supply to all of a sudden full of supply, but quality may be an issue. And then now we are seeing less capacities being available from China as well. So how can we have a more sustainable way of um, engaging uh, our suppliers to have the visibility? Digitalization will be the mainstream going forward to have it um, established. And talking about digitalization, everybody would think about technologies and there are so many technology options nowadays that you can choose from and to an extent that you may not even know which one would be the best for the scenario that you are trying to, um, to address. And uh, I am so pleased to uh, found that recently um, Deloitte Consulting actually has taken reference to all their past um, technology projects with clients and they have put together a digital digitalization capability model, a maturity model that kind of help companies, enterprise to um, structure your identification and investigation of what type of technologies and solutions that you may have to put in place. Uh, and that basically has uh, separate into six big categories and as in front of you in the screen uh, and more the immediate concerns will be how to build up an intelligent supply network um, for your supply chain and that actually takes you into a second level of um, of the capability that you can analyze your suppliers collaboration capability the total cost of ownership category management and the list goes on and because this model is um, a very full and integrated model um, perhaps Keith you, if you may allow, I would like to show them how the model can intertwine among all these factors later on um, after the slides. Um, so one more thing that we need to stress on digitalization for uh, avoiding um, disruption in the future, basically we are talking about how to improve our agility uh, performance along our supply chain. Um, yeah, if any one of you are familiar with the score performance attributes, um, actually the, uh, the measurement of agility has been defined quite well and that includes the upside supply chain adaptability, downside supply chain adaptability, which means when there is a swing of the demand or supply uh, either end, then how well can the supply chain adapt to those changes and be able to respond with minimum damages? And we can spend another hour to talk about how it's measured because it's all quantitative. But uh, in this 10 minute sharings, I don't want to go into that level of details, but we can have it offline for the technicality of it. And very importantly, the other matrix, the performance matrix that you want to measure in agility area is the overall value at risk. I don't 
think um, too many company is uh, seriously looking into the risk valuation at the moment with them or without the COVID-19 happening. Uh, that may be on, in the bottom of, of the uh, management list. But ever since this COVID-19 has, has happened and uh, we believe there will be second wave and second wave of, of the virus is happening actually in some part of the world. Um, the overall value at risk is very important to be understood. And uh, we will encourage people, uh, supply chain and transportation organizations to map out where would be your critical risk and how you can mitigate it. Other, uh, in addition to all the PPE that you may need to put in place, what are the other risks, especially for um, supply chain professions? What is your tier one and tier two uh, risk lies in, ahead of you? And especially nowadays, we are worrying about the um, sanction over China on USA technologies. Uh, in my business, we do a lot of um, purchase of electronic items, digital devices, and we are already worrying um, in next year. Oh, we may not see the impact this year because all the chip modules has been purchased and import to, to the factory. But when they use it up, then next year, can we still purchase those items from China? Just simply because of the impact of the sanction. Um, naturally, Taiwan will be our alternative source, but what else do we need to do to qualify the suppliers to ensure the compatibility of the products in order to make the digitalization projects run smoothly? Um, there is a lot of work and if any one of you are thinking about onboarding a digital transformation project, make sure you're addressing it from a top-down approach. Uh, you must engage your executive at the C-level. And if you're talking to a client, make sure you are at the C-suite um, level of contact to start the conversation. This is a multi-year plan to get the company um, digitalized and be able to digital, digitalize it from end to end of your uh, business process. And every technologies that you will put in place would have an impact on the other uh, side of, the, of your organizations. And this is really a project not about what technology to choose to use, but actually to align different culture, different people, different tasks, and also uh, structures of your business together smoothly. And usually we're talking about one to three years effort of um, handling any of the digitalization transformation. So um, remember when you have a project charter established, make sure you have tied your project to a, to a matrix that is in the agility performance attribute. If you cannot tie any of your investment to an agility uh, matrix, you have to rethink whether you're in the right direction. It may be a project that um, suitable in some other in some other areas of your supply chain. Okay, and. The last, I would like to show you uh, a saying from MIT uh, research scientists. Um, digital transformation uh, for business must is a must to embrace agility. And this is what all the technology investment is about. Um, so I will stop here and I will pass it back to Keith for any questions that you may want to ask. Thanks, Vicky. Um, I, we've got, um, as yet, um, our, our participants are quite slow in asking questions, so do ask any on the Q&A function, but you'll be pleased to know I've got several, Vicky, just to ask before Oliver then takes us into a different area. Um, I thought um, it'd be helpful, actually, just to talk a little bit about China, because that's one of the, uh, the big issues in terms of sourcing, and it was interesting you mentioned 
difficulties in getting information from China uh, that's being experienced by supply chain operators. Um, and uh, that gap, um, it was just asking you um, your thoughts on what a business can do to overcome that um, in terms of their supply. Mm. As, as a very critical question. In fact, um, for most of the supply chain professions uh, who has uh, always rely on data and quantitative approach to make their decisions, all of a sudden in the last few months, they will find it very difficult well, with the situation of China. Mm. And we expect this kind of difficulties will continue for another few months until uh, things get uh, settled down a bit. Um, however, there is a lot of other problems in China at the moment because of the heavy rain, because the dam is uh, releasing large amount of water in the south is uh, a lot of places has yeah. been flooded. So factories uh, impact, um, warehouses uh, have been damaged. Um, and then in July, the locust swarm somehow as uh, having, a, having some symptoms to, to be a serious attack in China. So mm. for the agriculture industry, uh, there will be a major disruption. So we do not expect China will be able to, uh, to be very transparent in data that they can release officially. Mm. However, uh, we all have good connections uh, in China and uh, those people on the ground may be able to give better insights um, to, to the supply chain people and tell them what the inventory and the production capability is about um, in the near future. That may be the only way right. we have to go qualitative. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so certainly work your, contact, your contacts in China, I think you're saying, but yes. um, also recognize there that, that that's interesting, a, a multiple number of other issues that's also impacting supply uh, from China. Yeah, it's a worrying situation. Yeah. Well, we, we come back, I think, in the general um, discussion into um, how businesses respond. We, we've covered two weeks ago topics of um, moving to uh, multiple sourcing and moving to nearshoring and things like that. So we'll come back, I'm sure, into that topic a bit um, later on. Just it would, would be helpful, I think. Uh, you showed the Deloitte's model um, and you mentioned, I think, um, just um, explaining that in a little bit more detail. Um, just the question there on the Deloitte's model, and I don't know if you've got any other slides, but ha how, how businesses should ap approach that use of the model in the current um, crisis. Um, actually, the Deloitte model is a relatively new release uh, from their research with a um, multiple number of companies. And I, I mean, actually, uh, just let me have to help me a little bit. Uh, I can show you how it works on the screen. Excellent. Um, you, do you want, do, do I have a minute or two to, to well, do you that. do you do because i think that'd be very helpful for people just to look at that in a little bit more detail that uh, diagram yeah so let me try whether it is this screen okay can you see the bubbles we can a little bit vague okay. with the writing but we get the principle i think yeah yeah as a little bit um the the colors a little light but um uh, basically the six areas that i have highlighted in in the slides in the powerpoint are the six areas in this model and if you are evaluating how to transform your supply chain or your process um to to be digitalized uh, in in your uh, sourcing area the intelligence supplied um project then you can click on this model and then uh, it will give you a list of the level two capabilities that you need to evaluate and areas that you need to look at. So, for example, if you look, click on the um, source execution and it gives you a list of relevant 
um, level two capabilities. And that actually give you a very good idea, comprehensive overview of if you are implementing uh, the source execution uh, technologies. What are the other process that you may likely to be impacting? And they categorize into high relations, medium and low. Okay. So, um, and at the bottom, it also highlights for you, if you are looking into this um, uh, project, then what are the likely business process will be in impact to you? And there's a very elaborated model. Um, and you, you, no matter which area you're working on, it gives you all the level one and level two impact. Hmm. Okay, and then they give you example as well. Excellent. So, so effectively, I think that links with the score model, doesn't it? That's the Deloitte's model linking their diagram gra grammatically with the score model you were talking about. Yes, that's yeah. correct. Because yeah. um, as actually a, 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 as a joint effort between uh, the score team and also with um, the Deloitte consulting team right. to create this model. Yes. Right. So. The, the business process screen will also take you to uh, the digital score model. Right, excellent. Yeah. So that, that's quite a detailed approach that people could consider and look at in terms of looking particularly at uh, an approach to digitalization is essentially yes. the, the message. Yeah. There, there, before we get to Oliver, I'll bring Oliver in a minute, but um, there's a couple of questions coming um, from John Harris and from Naliban Wajanji um, about how does a small medium sized enterprise um, approach this? Do, do you think that is the Deloitte's and the SCORE um, approach still valid for a smaller business, Vicky? I, I think it's a good reference tool uh, to take reference, but in terms of engaging the consulting team to do this work, uh, would typically be um, multi-million dollars of expenses on consultants. Mm. But um, I would encourage the SMEs to uh, take, the re take the model as reference, form your own executive team and then the project team to uh, investigate what your project charter should be like and what would be your list of projects to, to take place if you would have to establish say, for example, self-service um, type of technologies, um, mm. digitalization, and what are the impact areas? And that is a model that you can uh, take reference from. And it's a very handy handy tools to do so. Yeah, yeah. it's not very affordable for SME uh, as a full model, but um, it's good information to look at. Yeah, mm. so they might not be able to afford Deloitte's absolutely to engage, but. Um, but some of the principles and the processes are worth um, looking yes. at in detail. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Um, excellent. Well, we come back, I'm sure, to that subject. I'm sure there'll be other questions and questions are coming in. But um, as uh, part of our look at the, the subject, business continuity and risk, Oliver's going to uh, um, look at a different aspect of that. Um, and I'll hand over to Oliver to lead us through um, his presentation. Thank you, Keith. Uh, good morning. Um, good afternoon. Good evening to everyone as well. I hope everyone's well. And thanks, Vicky, for a really interesting and informative presentation. And I think it's um, useful that I maybe come at it from a slightly different point of view. So let me um, embrace technology and try and share my screen and hope that will work. Okay. Okay. So. Going back to risk management, um, I mean, I, I'm sure most of you will recognize the sort of grid that I've got on here, um, which um, looks at impact versus likelihood of different risks. And I guess the question that we've all asked ourselves, I'm sure we have over the time, is how prepared was I? You know, how prepared was my business for what happened during COVID? And I thought that was a good place to start for me. I've, I've taken this grid from a business that I used to work for, a risk management profile back from 2016. And I looked what it was the, what it was telling me. So good news, we had a risk up here, the top right, um, 
has said major quality health are regulatory issues. So we'd certainly had it in our minds to plan for it. Um, and, and that's a first start, understanding and mapping out the risks on a regular basis. Did we plan for it? So did we have a business continuity plan in place? And, and uh, you know, in my experience, um, business continuity is often a thing that businesses don't quite do so well. Spend a lot of time understanding the risks, um, but less time planning for the impact. And I, I was noted what Vicky said um, in her presentation that 44% of people didn't have a plan for source, um, for disruption of sourcing from China, which, which, which is exactly reinforces a point and says, it's all right to understand the risk, but unless you have a BCP in place, then that isn't very helpful. Um, key things that you do in a business continuity lifestyle life cycle, sorry, um, assess, identify the risk, which we talked about having a grid like that, understanding and, and quantifying the risks. Secondly, understanding the business impact analysis, what happens if that risk happens? And then thirdly, on the back of that, creating a plan. So what is my strategy if that risk happens and what is my plan for dealing with it? And fourthly, and almost most importantly, but probably the area that people do least about is to test and train it. Um, you know, to, to really kind of put it through its paces, really say, let's pretend that this risk is happening and let's make sure that everyone's in place and everyone actually understands this plan and is ready to do something about it. So I knew that in my um, previous business, we had a good business continuity plan and I'd actually been for training. It was good training. Um, and um, I was curious as to how well it had worked. So I called up one of my old senior managers and I said, well, how's it going over there? Um, and his answer is going absolutely brilliant. Everyone's working from home and all our contingencies are in place. It's as if we didn't actually have an issue. And in fact, he said, it's going so well that questions are starting to be asked about whether we need all the cost of real estate because people are working from home so effectively. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? It puts things into a different context. But for a good business um, continuity plan to work, it needs to have a number of key attributes. You need to have a purpose, so clear definition of the key areas to cover. What is a business continuity plan trying to achieve? So in this case, I was talking about, it was about home working. Scope, what's covered and what's not covered. And in this case, it was around managing without our key administration, administrative sites. Activation, what's the trigger? When do you actually use it? And again, in this case, this was about activation of the need to do it because of um, not being able to go to site and having to work from home. Detail. Detail is really important and, and, and often it's something that people don't focus enough on. Enough detail to make it worthwhile. Details of people, things like email addresses, phone numbers, VPN connections, how to upgrade your software, how to um, get hold of a laptop if you're, if you're based on a desktop, um, what to do when, what room should be used, who's, who the key contacts are, are. All those things that enable a business to move quickly into its contingency plans. Criticality. What are the critical activities that need to take place? So for instance, in a healthcare business, who are the customers who will suffer most? And how do you put your arms around them and have key plans to ensure that the continuity of supply to them? And any special arrangements that you may have as well. Business response. How will continuity be achieved? So that's both in the short term and in the medium term. In the short term, you'll be focusing on immediate actions to keep the business moving. And in the medium term, medium to long term you'll be working about how to work sustainably in a different environment once things are stabilized and then of course recovery and resumption how to get back to normal if ever we do get back to normal fine so we've identified the risk we've planned for it and we've activated those plans and maybe here is where just maybe step back for a second and think because um, we're used to a lot of risks most of us whether we've planned for them or not will have will have worked through and will have had a number of issues and risks that have happened in our time. We're prepared for managing these, a fire, a flood, the loss of a key customer. But all of these things are defined. They have life cycles that you can understand and that you can manage. But of course you could write a book, and I'm sure several will be written on what makes COVID unique in this situation that we're in at the moment. It's, unpredict it's unpredictability, the lack of certainty, about what things will look like and when. The enormous economic impact. I mean, you know, the UK figures, and you'll all have different figures, the UK figures look like 
We're in our biggest slump now for, three, for the last 300 years, which means we need to think further. We need to think differently. And I think it's around two things. Firstly, is how to continually adapt to the current situation. And secondly, is about how to prepare for the new normal. I've given some thought to both. These are really my thoughts and, and we can have a long discussion about whether they're right or they're wrong or go in lots of different directions, but I thought it's a good opportunity to have a debate around them. Around the current situation, you know, maybe we're almost through this crisis, maybe we're not. The economy is starting to emerge from lockdown, already fears of a second lockdown. We're already seeing in certain countries, and I think Vicky mentioned this again, you know, um, a second crisis, could it be bigger than the first? We just don't know. Huge swings in, in the financial markets daily as the, new as the news changes. So it's prudent and it's sensible to continue planning, continue to involve and to manage the situation that we have. And I think there are a few key areas that we should continue to focus on during this crisis. Firstly is crisis response. So make sure that you have a team or at least dedicated individuals to manage a crisis. Treat this as a crisis, set up a plan, a statement of work, a scope, assign responsibilities, make sure it's clear and managed with proper ownership and proper governance. As you stabilise and you shift the focus on how, how to bring people back to work, assess what you've done to date and make sure that you change course as and when you need it. Again, Vicky talked a lot about agility and the agility to be able to respond effectively is key here. Look at the organisational insights that this process has provided to help build your strategy going forward. You'll need to be more agile, but what have you learned in detail and how do you take that forward? Talk about people management. Protect your team, put your arms around your team. Make sure that you're, ho you're helping support your employees on a physical, but also a mental health basis, whether they're at work or whether they're at home. This needs to come to the fore and, and, and the, the, the measure of a good company through this is how well it has looked after its people during this time. Communicate effectively, communicate more. What's going on? What's the latest? What the policies are? How people are doing? How the business is doing? Communication becomes absolutely critical here. And often, ironically, it's actually a chance to spend more time reaching out to people as we stand behind our desks, or sit behind our desks, to, um, to reach out to people more and to make them feel more that they're part of this organization. Maintain continuity. As employees adapt to work re working remotely, make sure they have the tools and the support that they need. Assess your people costs and make sure that you make the right decisions. Don't be too short term in your thinking. Cutting people may seem like the only option, but it may not be, and it may be a knee jerk reaction. You need to keep your key people, you need to invest in them because you'll need them more than ever when things move back to a new normal. And the demand for agile and fresh thinking will be critical to move things forward effectively. Um, and prepare for recovery. Align your people planning with your business strategy. Prepare for changes, prepare for the unknown so that you can react as and when the time comes. Mitigate the supply chain disruption. I mean, again, the, the example of 44% supply chain disruption from China um, is key, but continue to identify alternate supply chain scenarios. Don't just stop when you have a, a one, but especially as lockdown rules change, things will move back differently. So model which scenarios may happen, which may not. Start to plan for them, start to put them in your thinking. Activate the contingencies that you have when you need. A change in design, a change in raw material. Think about your customer strategy. Think about your pricing strategy. What will happen to demand? What will happen to customer requirements? How to move forward and anticipate those. And be in a position to adapt to the right strategy when you need it. Your customer base is there for the long term. So how can you work with your key customers to predict changing consumer needs? How can you be ready for what that consumer demand will be? Assess your financial stability. What's the worst case scenario? What's the impact going to be on your financials and your cash flow? How are you going to be able to manage that? And what are the financial and the operational levers that you can pull, conserve and generate cash? What are the implications of each? What are your mechanisms for choice? And finally, refocus your strategy. Your strategic priorities may have changed. We've heard about digital transformation, which may need to become a key driver, but also look at your key strategic plans. Look at your assumptions around growth and profitability. How have they changed? Take the pulse of your customers. What are the long-term considerations about shifts in core markets or core business models? And rebuild your strategy on the new world and the new normal. 
which brings us finally my view to the new normal and what will that be i mean we don't know but when we emerge eventually i think common consensus is that we'll be changed in a detailed level but also maybe fundamentally and that what's that mean it means I think the risks of the future may be very different to the risks of today. Businesses that understand these, that plan for these, that shape our thinking and decision-making in the future will be the best place to move forward effectively. And of course, we don't know what those will be, but I've put a few thoughts to consider. Capitalism 2.0. I mean, this is a, a phrase that has been used uh, over the last few years. Um, but there are, and, and, and maybe it's a time to look back at it and say, are we ready to embrace this in a different way? Big questions are already being asked about why this situation happened. You know, what was the impact of our relentless focus on profit, on shareholder value, on driving down costs, and how did that contribute to the impact of the crisis? I mean, I'm not trying to create a debate on what's right and what's wrong, and I'm not trying to um, give a view on that, but I'm saying it needs to be taken into consideration. Businesses need to recognise that and tap into the feeling of the new zeitgeist. Those ones that do could be the ones that gain the most. Those, are, those that help reinventing capitalism, see it through a lens where we learn our lessons, where the increased support of C the importance of CSR, corporate and social responsibility, where we increase the value of human capital across the global supply chain, recognising that and moving forward with that. Globalisation. Is it the end of globalization? Absolutely not. Of course, it's not the end of globalization. But will we need to reconsider it? What would happen to those core strategies? Businesses built around globalization, supply chains located in the lowest countries. How much will that be challenged? How will we have to relook at our supply chains? The value of local, the value of flexible, the risks are lower, the impacts of things like COVID can be managed more in a more controlled and more effective way the ability to react to change, the ability to adapt. All of those things will need to con be considered and, and, and our fundamental supply chain strategies seen through that lens. And of course, that will have an impact on margins and on profitability. Businesses will look to optimise cost and profitability in efforts to recover. If some of the levers of long-term profitability change, if businesses have to take a hit on percentage points on their margin, the question is how and where will they recover that? What are the risks to pricing, to volume, to the customer base? In the long term, could we look at the reassessment of the margin levers and the fundamental business models that drive strategy? And maybe, of course, the biggest unknown, will there be constant disruption? I mean, we've seen COVID and we've seen what it can do socially. And of course, we're, we're steeped in the economic impacts, but we don't know where those will end. But we're focused on this one. We're focused on COVID. What comes next? In this connected world, how protected are we from the next global disruption? What lessons have we learned? You look at the history of pandemics. They used to happen every 100 years or so. But in the same way that climate change has marginalized our assumptions about normality, will we see a similar trend going forward? We're already starting to see it. We've seen SARS, we've seen MERS all in the last 10, 15, 20 years. How often will it happen? Will it happen every 10 years? Will it happen every five years? Will we have to lock down every few years? Will that, will that have to become a fundamental part of the way that we do business? And our risk planning should start to prepare for this, should start to plan for constant disruption, where there'll be a potential need to move away from the longer term and embrace agility in our strategies as well as our execution. Will we need to think of a long-term strategy as focusing on the next year or the next five years? Will we need to reassess our markets and our customers. And of course, it's all underpinned by people. We need to think about the skills, the capabilities needed, and we need to plan for them to survive and to grow. The leaders of tomorrow will live in a far more uncertain world, and we'll need to start adapting now in order to be ready, for us to be ready and for them to be ready. And it's up to us to lay the foundations for them and prepare them to succeed. So just some thoughts, just some initial ideas, we don't know what will happen. We don't know how wrong I am, how, you know, where things will go. But to be effective at risk management, we need to constantly change and adapt. And if there's one thing that um, the current crisis should tell us, it should put an absolute focus on the criticality of effective risk management, the criticality of looking at what might happen, preparing and planning for the future in our businesses. Okay.
and that's um, all I wanted to cover. So thank you. Thanks, Oliver. Thanks. Excellent. Um, we've got uh, a couple of questions that I'd like to ask you before we go to the main uh, no, main panel, um, sure. because they're directly uh, linked into uh, the business continuity planning, and one from um, Edward Lau from Singapore, and one from Lindsay Oxlade. So I'll, I'll start with Edward's one. Um, that's if I can find it. Um, should be there on my screen here. Um, looks like somebody's moved that across. Yes, I don't think this has been answered, but um, uh, um, I will. Oliver, bear with me because I shall have sure, to do it sure, as sure. I remember it because it seems to have disappeared off the screen. Um, the, um, the the question Edward was asking really is basically. You did your business continuity plan. You had a great example of um, uh, a business where that worked. Does that now go? Is that now in the in the drawer and uh, just put away, or um, should you now be um, revising it, reviewing it? Because there is a big risk out there. Don't we know it about perhaps second waves, etc. Mm. Uh, or the, I guess a line to that, which Edward didn't actually ask, but. If you, if you never, never did a business continuity plan in the first place, should you start now or actually just get on with managing the situation? What's your perspective on that? Um, so to the first one, yeah, yes, absolutely. And I, I, and I think, you know, what I was, um, what I was trying to build to life is that, you know, the, the situation especially is continuing to change. So your point about the second wave, you, you know, we don't know what the risks are. The, the, this is one of the interesting things about COVID, isn't it? You know, if, if your factory burns down, you can have a plan to, you know, you hopefully you've got a contingency plan in place. You have a plan to have secondary supply while you put your factory back together. And you can, you, you know, you, you can be fairly clear about what the plans on this are. With, um, with COVID, we don't know, do we? We don't know that whether there's going to be a second wave. We don't know what the impact is going to be on the second wave. We don't know the longer term. So I think the interesting thing here, here is we need to consist continually refresh and review our risk management plans to take account of the future, both in terms of our commercial strategy, but also in terms of our supply chain strategy. Um, and, and we should, you know, when, when we have finally got to a place where we can sit and breathe for a while, we should then look at all of our risks in the context of what's happening and say, are our business continuity plans strong enough to deal with this? Because in some respects they will be, and you know the, the example that I used, you know that they they were, and that was good. But in a lot of, in a lot of respects, they won't be, and and kind of kicking the tires on them, pressure testing how well they um, coped and how well they will need to cope in the future will be really important. Mm -hmm. um, so that was sort of my first one. To my second, to to your second question, um, yes, fundamentally, I mean, um, it's it. it it's slightly difficult to answer. I mean, if, if you didn't have a business continuity plan in place, I, I think the critical thing is to ensure that you have actions in place now to stabilize your business and move it for, move them forward. Whether you choose to call those, this is our business continuity plan, whether you choose to call that our crisis management response is, I mean, to an extent, a little bit of a semantic question, but, but I think the key thing is it's not too late and you should absolutely, be treating this like a plan. You should, you know, you should have people in place. You know, you have a war room where you do whatever you take, but to make sure that you manage this and you 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 deal with this in a planned and in a structured way, I think it's critical. Excellent, and Edward. I found I found Edward's question now. I think just to um, basically, you've answered most of it, but um, he just says, have, "Have you observed or heard companies that have already started to?" conduct any debriefings due to this COVID crisis and uh, planning their respective um, BCP update? Um, yeah, let me think. Yeah, yeah, one, one or two come to mind and, um, sorry, that's, um, one or two come to mind and, and, and you know, I, I think it's where a, a lot of it is where they didn't have the kind of robustness of their plans in place. And I, I think it's interesting actually, they, you know, I think they felt that they were in a good position. You know, they felt that they had 
um, they had identified their risks and they had their business continuity plans in place. But when it actually came to it, they didn't work very well. So, you know, I can think of one example, and you know, a reference a little bit, you know, is working from home. If everyone, um, you, if, if half your people have desktop, um, you know, desktop machines and don't have laptops, you're suddenly asking them, them to work from home. Yeah. You've suddenly got an issue. And, and that, was, that, that was, you know, a slightly bizarre example, but an example that talking to one business, that's exactly what they faced. Um, and suddenly getting that in place and suddenly getting their IT infrastructure in place. So, you know, whether it's Microsoft Teams or shared drives or, or whatever the, the solutions, they're not difficult, but to have them in place so you don't spend your first few weeks rushing around and trying to put sticking plaster over things just to, just to enable your business to work in a, in a basic way. I think those are the things. And I think that, that's maybe one of the interesting lessons is, don't forget the basics are so critical when it comes to a BCP. Excellent. No, thanks, Oliver. The, the, I'll just finish off with one question direct to you and then I'll bring in Vicky and uh, Radzak to uh, also with their perspective really on, the, uh, on the, 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 the plans that you can make ahead of um, these type of events. Lindsay asked, one, asked a question here, how should enterprises guard against black swan events in their BCP rather than build high levels of inventory, which has a cost penalty? Of course, inventory for us in the UK was uh, one of the securities against the Brexit um, mm. sudden uh, uh, dropout. Um, but I guess for um, the brewers, inventory probably wasn't a very good thing for those supplying the pubs and clubs. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, just any thoughts there in terms of... Um... Well, I, I, I mean, my view, um, I, I think it's about understanding your business, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. inventory is one of the levers that you can, you can have, you know, you can, you know, um, agility in your supply chain, backup suppliers. Um, for instance, our, our other levers, you know, understand your customer base and having having way, you know, depending on what you're in, having ways of dealing and managing with your customers in emergencies is, is also a way. So, so I think across your extended supply chain is understanding the levers of profit and the levers of cost. Um, and then, you know, being able to say, you know, what are the different options to do it to, to be able to manage it? So inventory, yes, of course, inventory is one, but you're not that we're not going to hold um, three weeks work more worth of inventory from now forever because of what happened in COVID, are we? What we should be doing is we should be able, we should be looking at, um, you know, our, react, our reactivity. So if we see something, because we, you know, if you look at the UK, we had visibility that this was going to happen. Most people saw the lockdown was going to happen. Most people could have predicted it. So having that ability to react effectively and switch on alternative sources of supply or build inventory quickly if it's needed is critical and of course having the the warehouse capacity and space to be able to deal with that um, but also having that reactivity and flexibility in your supply chain you know th and this, this is what one of the the areas i've touched on you know having a more localized supply chain going forward is a question i think a lot of businesses should and, and will be asking to say that the you know we're, we're focused for the last um you know 20 25 years on becoming more and more global and, and driving costs out of our supply chains and and of course that's a, that that's created significant additional risk so that needs to be re-looked at and potentially rebalanced against if if these crises happen on a more regular basis what are the um what are the risks of that and what are the alternative options that can be looked at which will mitigate some of the cost implications let's bring in the whole panel now thank you oliver for that um the just immediate perspectives vicky um and radzak on um planning and, and business uh, continuity planning and your experience of that and what businesses should should shouldn't be doing um, now, before I go to the next question um, on the list, Vicky, any uh, thoughts for you about business planning? Yeah, just um, about yeah, planning and and being prepared for the next or the next wave or the next crisis. Um, I 
information, visibility of data, inventory and production capacity status. Those are very key information that you have to get your suppliers uh, to be transparent with you. And uh, if we have to turn it to a digital way of doing it in the short term, um, I was reading the questions uh, from, from the participants just now and I was thinking whether we have a quick and easy way to fix it. And I think maybe, maybe CCTV surveillance camera together with video analytics in the warehouses, in the shop floors uh, would give you the real time and most direct assessments of whether the situation is uh, right for any of your supply chain. Uh, as, uh, and if we're trying to set up a huge database uh, with consolidated um, information and assessment and things like that, it may take a longer time than, than you may expect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, um, if you do need that visibility and it's not there for you yet, um, try to think of a quick way, especially for the SME uh, to you know, start looking into maybe spending of like 20 to 30,000 US dollars and you can get pretty good solutions uh, and be able to see things from another part, side of the world for you. Yeah. And then, um, of course, I always encourage people to start thinking about your uh, digital transformation plan because sooner or later you will have to start doing it. If you look at the banking industry, they have started many years ago and they have continuously invested in digitalizing their business process and if you think about uh, how does COVID-19 impact the banking business actually it's relatively minor because we still can trade we still can make our payment and we can still receive our uh, customers payment to keep the business going so start uh, taking digitalization seriously. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to go for the full uh, Deloitte module, as uh, some of the participants has asked the question, it can be very costly. Um, at least to get the project team together in-house, and if you need to hire a facilitator to facilitate the brainstorming section, imagine what you want to do with your digital plan, what would be the end game for, uh, that you want to see and then um, help you, the facilitator hopefully would be able to help you to select or recommend uh, the type of technologies and solutions that um, you should try in POC and evaluate the results, the appropriateness for you before you actually have to put in big dollars to deploy. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I think would be a, a short and medium term two steps approach get the immediate things done and at the same time start to think about the near future in the sure. next few years what do you okay. need to do okay. yeah. excellent thanks vicky and and i like any immediate um, thoughts on um business planning and uh, what the response should be now yeah um we have to look into mid or long-term changes in the sector itself um while we are talking about digitization and all that, uh, uh, the new normal has forced us uh, to change our way of doing things from globalization to regionalization. Uh, I remember those days that we are creating a global farm all over the world. Uh, container ship has gone to what, second, third, fourth generation and carrying about 22,000, uh, 22, 14,000 uh, containers, TUs, and all that. But uh, amidst COVID and everything that we are looking at, uh, uh, I, I don't think, you know, uh, transcontinent uh, kind of uh, long distance carrying cargoes and all that is, 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 is available or it is something that is the future uh, in the world today that we are talking about. Because supply chain cannot be from one source. Uh, the problem was uh, for the last what seven, eight, or ten years, uh, China has has created you know uh, the 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 source of supply and all that, and almost uh, it is it is one way uh, kind of uh, you know uh, 
uh, things that is moving up and down. But now it looks like that uh, uh, there will be different different movements from east to west, could be from north to south and all that. Uh, and with uh, US and China now is, uh, you know, in the loggerhead and all that, uh, it is also changed, you know, the scenario of the logistics pattern, yeah? So, mm. uh, and, and we can't, we can't, we can't actually, uh, depending on the single sourcing now, we have to find, you know, uh, other sourcing. I, I, even, even in Hong Kong, for instance, when they, they face problems of, you know, uh, what they call uh, demonstration or the way before COVID came, uh, I know for the fact that uh, Malaysians uh, manufacturers are very much depending buying things from China through Hong Kong because that is the traditional and historical trading house that they have been doing all this while for years. And, and when, when there was a hiccup uh, because of the demonstration and all that, uh, uh, you know, component uh, manufacturing items that they are supposed to have uh, slightly delayed and sometimes doesn't come. There's no fault of anybody, but uh, it looks like that when COVID comes, then uh, the whole pattern seems to be changing, you know, all mm. over the world. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I think that's, that's, that's the thing that I want to say. Th thanks, Razak. Well, I'm going to, there's a lot of excellent questions coming in. So I want to ask those specifically, and the panel can um, some, can see um, those those questions on on the screen. Um, and um, one one from uh, Lindsay Oxlade again: Should we regard the COVID nineteen responses as a short ter as short term disruptions to business as usual, or a long term paradigm shift? Um, let's just get short answers from the panel in terms of, do you think it's going to go back to normal or is this a long-term paradigm sh shift? Um, Oliver, oh, your, your view on that. You, you go, you go. Uh, okay, sorry. Oliver. sorry, sorry, sorry. You go, um, yeah, no, sorry. I, I, I think I um, covered in my presentation, but I think um, that, you know, it's going to be both. I mean, we're seeing that there's a short term getting over this hump, but I think there will be a definite long-term change in the basic fundamentals of business? A very short answer. You're on mute, Keith. I'm on mute. Vicky, are you of the same mind? Um, I would say that definitely will be a new normal. Okay, the new normal, at least for those who are in sourcing and supply management, you have to have multiple source of uh, suppliers, even though uh, they may be very unique in terms of technology or qualities. Uh, you will have to have a second uh, backup uh, group of supply, supply network. And um, secondly, uh, China is definitely not going to be the center for manufacturing. Uh, as I am predicting, because there are too many concerns uh, in too many fronts. Uh, so the world, the, the manufacturing process volume will have to spread uh, at least among the Asia countries uh, for those who have interest in developed uh, to develop the manufacturing capability. Uh, Singapore has been uh, many steps ahead of the others because they have choose the uh, high value items to be produced in Singapore, I think since uh, eight years ago, um, as a very wise move. And then um, the other countries may really have to think fast and hard. What do they want to pick up uh, from the China's uh, overspilled type of um, items for them to, to manufacture? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Um, Radzak, you were going to just come in on this, your perspective on short or long-term or uh, major change. Yeah, I agree with Vicky. Uh, anything that happened in this life, uh, the new normal sets to begin. After some times, you know, the, uh, the revolving change will go, the new normal become an old normal. And, and it, it is a continuous change in life. And I said, uh, after crisis, uh, the way forward, and if you want to succeed, 
then uh, you adapt the new normal the quickest time possible. Don't wait for it. Otherwise, we'll be left. Yeah. 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 So anticipate and uh, make those decisions. Um, I'm going to, yeah. um, because we've got so many questions coming in, I'm going to be quite specific. I think this, this one is probably for Vicky. Um, should companies, particularly SMEs, be not only looking at the cost of a risk event, but also the affordability of mitigation measures? Uh, that's from Jane Green, but that seemed to be sort of where your your model was indicating um, some some routes for doing that. As always, a balance. Uh, any decision we made. Uh, uh, you know, uh, to hit our supply chain performance goal have to be at the expenses of the other attributes. So how much cost do we want to invest in agility? Um, before the COVID-19, uh, people want to minimize the cost uh, in addressing agility. i give you an example. Nissan used to have um, a very high uh, agility uh, uh, performance index. And when there was a major earthquake in Japan many years ago, um, Nissan was the only automobile company from Japan who can uh, maintain all the orders and still deliver on time and at the same time uh, take uh, the competitor's order to their, to their uh, bucket as well. And just because they have looked at agility seriously, they have multiple sourcing in different countries, uh, chips and, and the replacement modules and all that. But then uh, they somehow <laughs> have not followed through. And, and they are also in serious trouble nowadays. Um, so that tells us um, we have to be alert, uh, always be alert at a certain level for agility, although it may cost us something, but we have to balance the cost that uh, we want to maintain the level of agilities that you want to hit. And I, I saw some questions about, well, the suppliers were used to providing 20% of supply to, to the key customer, but now uh, it's all jumped up to 80%. Well, this is also uh, an agility uh, performance uh, readiness. Um, why would someone have so much stock to provide four times of what they would usually <laughs> hold? And uh, how much money that has been tied up in that supply chain and not allowing them the opportunity to make, to make better money out of it along the way? So all of this uh, have to be well balanced. We cannot say that um, we, we are investing in agility and then we cannot have enough money to buy raw materials to produce anything that would get us uh, to be out of business. Okay, mm. so we have to uh, balance it. And in my last slides, it actually is five attributes for supply chain um, performance. And it has to be a balance among the five, not just one, okay? Very good, and there's, there's quite a number of questions on that, which we've got, Paul Nadibi was asking again about inventory and the, uh, the contingencies um, and is it wise to actually build um, uh, inventory at this time uh, and that's supported a little bit by Guyani saying, Guyani Duval was saying we now have to move from just in time to just in case to minimize the disruptions. Uh, so Oliver, your, your perspective big again on that, um, I'm covering th a number of questions here but um, this, this yeah. balance between and how do you get to that that decision mark point at this moment? Do you go be are you, should you be conservative? And um, as Vicky says, that brings in cost dimensions to that, or should you aim at hyper agility as Clinton mentions in his? Uh, so is it hyper agility or reliability, and, and where's the balance? Um, yeah, and, and I mean I'm not sure I, I can add that much more to what Vicky said. I mean I mean just mm. going back to that. That question that um, that I think it was Jane's question um, that said, you know, sh should you also consider the affordability of, of risk mitigation strategies? And of course you should. I mean, you know, it, it all comes down to the same thing at the end of the day. It all comes down to understanding the cost of what what the different options you um, um, 
you, you can choose will be versus what the benefit of, of them will be. You know, should we move from just in time to just in case? Well, interesting question, but then I would argue a risk mitigation plan is a just in case plan. So you shouldn't, you should already know what your just in case is. You should already have that planned and you should already have an understanding of what those costs are and what the impact is. How, how far do you move down the agility and the flexibility route is a question that each business will have to understand and, and decide by itself. But in order to make a good decision about that, you have to have a good handle on what your costs are, your true cost of doing business. An example, yeah, yeah. inventory. I mean, most, most businesses underestimate the cost of inventory. Most businesses say cost of inventory is about 10% of, um, um, of, of the value of the inventory. But the reality is it's far closer to 20%. When you look at the, where, you know, the, the, um, the fully absorbed warehousing costs, when you look at the end-to-end -end impact of that. You know, so understanding that un and understanding what the true costs and the true elements of your business are, then you should be able to say, and then it's a decision, isn't it? You know, what is, um, you know, are we prepared to invest in secondary sourcing? Are we prepared to invest in more flexible supply chains? Is there will be a cost associated with that versus what is the risk of continued business disruption and the costs associated with that? But you should be looking at it. I think there was a question on suppliers as well. And, and that's right, you should be working with your suppliers, but you should also be working with your customers. And you shouldn't just be working from a supply chain point of view. You should be working from an end-to-end -end business point of view. Understand the impact on revenue. Understand the impact on margin. You know, if your prices go up, what is your what is your price flexibility in your customer base? All of those things are are part of being able to understand what are the impacts of um, of, of continual disruption, and what mitigations make sense from a cost and from a profitability point of view. Mute. You're on mute. I'm on mute, Ashley. Despite my training, I still fail. <laughs> so uh, let's um, let's bring. Uh, I want to ask it a totally different, or ask one of the questions. It's in totally different field. Um, I'll bring in Ransack for this one uh, because it's actually getting into some air, a territory we covered a couple of weeks ago. Um, so we've spoken about China. We ought to give. Um, Mr. Trump, a little bit of space on this um, webinar. Uh, the question from Lindsay Oxlid is how to mitigate impacts of US protectionism and politics as it affects supply chains. Uh, Radzak, what's your, your feel um, for answering that one? <laughs> let's see what is happening you know end of uh, is it november <laughs> or september yes <laughs> <laughs> that's a good <laughs> nothing can be, uh, yeah nothing can be done at this time you know everything doesn't seem to work you know according i have been almost every night uh, sitting in front of uh, you know uh, coincidentally amidst covid 19 with the lockdown and and watching cnn you know uh, <laughs> Nothing yes. is good for Mr. Trump now. So, <laughs> so I tell you uh, again, again. Uh, you see, uh, the lesson behind it uh, is going to be change, and change is always permanent. What is uh, you know what is permanent in life is only change. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. else. We keep on changing. <laughs> so again, again we. Comment. It, that was a, it was a very challenging question, I think, for anybody to answer. But again, it, it, it requires us to think through and be prepared, as to, I think, in many senses. There's, there's many different political factors that uh, yeah. are happening out there. And just to be aware of that's good. Um, Oliver, um, we had a question from um, John Harris just on the specifics of um, business continuity planning, because I know you've, you've, you've put a lot of um, um, time in this in your, your um, um, business career. Uh, how often should a uh, business continuity plan be reviewed and what's the best way to embed this into the fabric of the business? And that's from John Harris. 
Thanks, John. Um, how often should it be reviewed? I mean, I, I think in 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 my career, um, in the businesses I worked for, we tended to review it um, about every six months. Um, review the risks, ensure that we had continuity plans that met the risks, and ensure that the continuity plans were up to scratch. And we would have training on the back of that. So, so that's my experience of doing that. I, I think the um, you know, the, the big question now that we'll, we'll have to ask ourselves is, is that going to be enough, um, you know, in the new normal? How quickly, are the, how, how quickly do the fundamentals change? And therefore, how, quick, uh, how out of date can, um, how quickly can things go out of date? Sorry, I'm not expressing myself well. So I, I think there will be a challenge to do it more often, um, you know, and, and maybe a light yeah. touch, but, but certainly have some view on just checking those things. And so the second part was how to embed it into... Yeah, how do you business. embed it into the business, uh, into the yeah. fabric of the business? Yeah, yeah I mean, look, I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, the obvious point, you know, that everyone would say it needs to be top down, it needs to be sponsored by the executive. All of those go without saying. I, I think there is a big opportunity now. If business continuity planning isn't embedded into your business right now, then just put a big poster up saying, look what happened during COVID-19 and we got that wrong. We need to get it right now. So, you know, if you can't embed it now after what's happened, then you're never going to embed it, I think. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so lots there for people to take away, I think, in that whole business continuity planning approach. Um, Vicky um, and uh, Radsack, really, there's a question here from Finbar Cleary. Um, I think Finbar's taking uh, probably a view in respect to China maybe, but he says the links, supply chains, air, sea, rail, transport between suppliers and then clients have collapsed, also collapsed. What are the presenters' views? I mean, what's your perspective? Have they, have they collapsed um, in terms of, uh, or are they in crisis? Um, and basically how do we respond? Um, to that at this current point in time. Vicky, do you want to have a go at that one? Um, yes, uh, I will try. And in fact, um, all of this transportation mode has to be the dependence of how well the trade is doing and it's always secondary. Um, so it is um, unavoidable to see the uh, difficult time that it's going through. But the hardware will always be there. Uh, the cost, whoever has the biggest, deepest, uh, deepest pocket to maintain the crew and the expenses for the fleet um, may be the eventual winner. So I won't say as to an extent of collapse, but um, they are struggling, uh, trying to survive, but they will. At least some of them. Yeah, yeah. Do you, what, what, from a Malaysia uh, viewpoint, um, Southeast Asia viewpoint, uh, Radzak, are, are you seeing a collapse in the in the basic transport infrastructure, or are they now coming out of the um, the other side of that in air, sea, or rail? Uh, air is probably a subject of it in its own. Um, needs its own focus, but sea rail and transport and road transport. Yeah, uh, when you talk about transportation, uh, especially uh, ASEAN, uh, I don't know whether we are lucky or not, uh, but uh, even Indonesia has got 7,000, more than 7,000 uh, islands around that you need to transport things from one island to the other island, hoping and all that. Then you have uh, uh, Philippines, another, I don't know, a few thousand islands. Uh, of course, Malaysia has got three islands only around. Uh, but uh, all in all, uh, with 615 million people living in Asia, uh, I believe that uh, the time will come that uh, when uh, most of the uh, manufacturing, you know, uh, will move from China to Southeast Asia because uh, Southeast Asia is supposed to be ranked number four, uh, number four uh, 
uh, a place of exodus to 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 the uh, Taiwanese and Chinese uh, manufacturing investors. Uh, I mean, the, of course, number one is Vietnam, number two is India, number three is Chile, and number four is uh, uh, ASEAN, ASEAN region, mm -hmm. and Malaysia is one of them. So I believe that uh, there are always uh, good things that could happen. But again, uh, uh, it's not uh, like what it was uh, before. It is something that you have to get more of digitization, more of transformation of, uh, you know, uh, digitalization and all that, and um, the IoT and the AI and all that has to play a very important role you know, in this. But physically, you you need someone to carry them, you know, across this uh, seven thousand, eight thousand island, you know, small small one where it is uh, inhabited by people and all that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that's yeah. my my overall. Excellent. Thank you. Well. Um, We've answered most of the questions. There's a couple that uh, from Abby, Hamid, and Fariji, um, which I think we've answered in part, but unfortunately we've run out of uh, time now uh, for today. And thank you very much, those who've um, contributed uh, with comments and with questions. Uh, it's really helped uh, the event. But uh, you, I want to allow uh, the final remarks to be made um, our international president, uh, Dato Radzak Malek, um, just to close off today's session. So, Dato, back, back to you just to um, make your closing remarks. Thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, Keith. Uh, yeah, thank you to our two excellent speakers for covering this important subject of business continuity and risk. COVID-19 continues to create supply situations we could never have foreseen or planned for in the pre-COVID world. The two speakers have shown us how COVID-19 will make us review our business approach to risk management in a very different way in the future. Opportunities uh, for steps Changes in the supply chains are already out there for those quick thinking enough to take them. Technology to remove bottlenecks in supply and speed information flow and resource new ways of meeting and customer needs is there. Rewards will come to those. In reality, my personal opinion, there are potential losers and there are potential winners in business. All businesses will have to go through the change curve. Looking to the past with the sentiment of denial and anger, but looking to the future, the determination with, with exploring acceptance, we need confidence, morale and effectiveness and time determine the result. Thanks to you, the audience, for the excellent question asked and speakers for their insightful and informed discussion. May I, on your behalf, uh, thanks Vicky and Oliver for the input into an excellent session. Last week, we issued our sixth bulletin focus on the subject for business risk. So please also look at that material which cover this topic so well. This webinar has been recorded, so please share the recording with your members and colleagues in your country and region. Join our online discussions and participate in our international and branch social media platform. We are continuing to hold our webinars once every two weeks. Our next topic will have a humanitarian and an African focus. We are partnering with Humanitarian Logistic Association and Transit, as well as inviting two speakers from our CRTs in Nigeria and Ghana. Learning across countries and across sectors has become critical in the COVID and post-COVID-19 world. As CILT, we are using our strength in networking and sharing, and this webinar will be a great example of this on July 1st. 
So please add that date to your diaries. And as CRT, we have been holding webinars on related subjects in many countries. So do look out for those. Uh, finally, could I say keep safe and thanks again for joining us today. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye bye. See you soon.